I'd love to welcome everybody back to the Independent Investor here. We are kicking off 2023 with a bang. This is the first exclusive uh, interview we have with the co-founder CEO of Aduro Clean Technologies, Mr. Ofer Vikas. He has been kind enough to parlay from his busy schedule and speak directly to uh, the, uh, uh, the developments that are going on right now, and they are exciting and they are vast. I want to take this opportunity and invite everybody to the description, uh, finding all the information for EduroCleanTech.com. Disclaimers and disclosures, as well as my current share position, will be disclosed in the description for full transparency. Please use these resources in understanding how we all have a responsibility in getting on board with what Aduro Clean Technologies brings to bear. Ofer, welcome to the channel. Please take a quick moment here and give us a quick rundown of the history of Aduro and really the passion that drives what it is that you're trying to bring to the marketplace here uh, in trying to solve the plastic problem. Certainly. Uh, uh, hi, Ryan. Thank you very much for having me. And it's always an honor to speak out with investors. We, we are actually looking forward to do that. We want uh, the opportunity to uh, show our voice and explain our case. And so, yes, it's, it's an honor, but also a great opportunity to be here. And, and uh, thank you very much for doing that. Um, as for the history of Aduro and the passion behind it, it's... Um, Duro's uh, idea was found somewhere in 2009, much before it was conceived, when I found this technology that is, uh, came from Alberta. And it wasn't entirely our technology. It was a nearby technology. And um, I show it at the time to my partner uh, today, my partner in crime, the CTO, the CTO Marcus yeah. Trickstead. Yeah. And um, the immediate question that he came back and asked is... Um, you know that whatever they do and everyone looks at it, they don't really, doesn't really happen. And so I got intrigued and I said, hold on, what do you mean by that? And he said, I just, I just don't know why nobody else is, is, is reading the science the way I read it. And so at that moment, we, you know, we, we paused and uh, we took about three years uh, to investigate quietly what's going on uh with the chemistry that we are promoting on and, and it was a little bit like an onion case where you learn uh through your motion what's going on there um what we understood is basically that uh, uh when you when you are promoting the chemistry that uh, we think we you know people thought that they are promoting um they there are certain things uh, that where they're hidden and and nobody pay attention to that and so when you look at the articles and everything around the articles, uh, the publications and the efforts to do pilots, everyone explained this in a certain way that, that you know, to support uh, some kind of a chemistry that actually not, did not happen. And the, in, at the fundamental, basically, when you take water and press it into a supercritical condition, um, it remains at supercritical condition unless you introduce foreign material. And uh, once you introduce for new material, of course, the, the, the environment is changing and water are no longer the same, has the same characteristic because you just introduced. And most of the research, to our surprise, were continue with the supercritical uh, condition. And we've been uh, immediately understood that we're working below. That kind of opened for us uh, what I called uh, a, a positive Pandora box where we looked at uh, information, we look at, uh, we had the opportunity to quietly look secretly at what the publications are. We realized what's going on there. And then we thought, okay, we have to, you know, we have to kind of understand it a little bit and, and uh, be able to, to develop it and understand exactly what's going on. So that's, that's for the history. Fast forward um, into it, we, we started with heavy oil and uh, we realized that we could do some things in the heavy oil uh, at a time. Uh, we based our first patent, uh, our first patent, to our surprise, in in a place where every the first patent that we were that we found on record was 1930, and so there was a lot of players in the market at the time. Um, all the big boys have been there, all the big companies have been there, yeah. and um, uh, our patent uh, with our 30 first 36 claim, which is quite a lot sail through and we were among the 10 percent of of this audience the examiner did not find any reason to to push back 
And that was a, a big wake up moment because we thought, okay, there is some, some kind of a novelty that, that nobody else is putting and looking around. Um, and then we moved to investigate. We realized that we fast forward a few years, uh, we realized we, we have to do some work on renewable oils. Uh, and there is correlation between those technologies, those yes, applications. Sir. And um, um, from bitumen to renewable oil, and I'll explain later what was the connection. Uh, I'll just say that uh, we've been ready to produce more patents. And then we realized basically that uh, there is a similarity uh, basically between the bitumen uh, and what's going on in renewable and bitumen in plastic. And so what we did basically is took our knowledge from bitumen and, uh, and, and renewable and just, uh, you know, attack the plastic stage. So the net result was uh, eight patents in, in uh, less than 10 years. Uh, seven of them are ours and, are pe- you know, are, are granted. One of them is pending. Yep. And a lot of know-how, new science that came out that is really novel and hasn't been done before the way we are promoting it. Now, just recently, the third-party verification that mm-hmm. was uh, provided for the technology, what did that mean in way of verifying what it is that you guys had been working so hard uh, over the last decade to get to this point? Yeah, so, so you know, in our hearts, we knew, of course, but uh, yeah. we, needed, we needed the investors because the investors have heard a lot of stories before. Yeah. And um, you had to go somewhere outside and... Uh, and make sure that uh, you you are presenting the chemistry in such a way that it's been confirmed that the science is there. Yeah. And I'll say that there is two levels there that one maybe is more important than the other. When we started it, we said, yeah, we'll, we'll just produce a third-party report, which was, at the time, it was in our, our professor uh, that we've been working at the Western University. But really, Ryan, uh, the third-party validation comes later from the operators and the pot- potential partners that has been asking us many, many hard questions, you know, lots of them. And you have to protect and st- tell the same story again and again and again. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, we don't put it out there because we, we only produce in the news. We only put uh, out the news that are actually material in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't talk about, you know, engagement where we have with other uh, possible partners. We have a lot of those, but we don't talk about them because it's not a deal until it's a deal. And we, we really That's want right. to be shy from anything of, uh, you know, the push uh, kind of activity that maybe sometimes you could be mistaken to do. Of course. And um, uh, these guys are pushing back uh, left, right and center. And so we've been confident in our ability to do and to protect the, the science behind it. And for us, what's remained is really beyond that was really to uh, put it into the motion of moving it from the lab uh, towards a commercial uh, application. So yeah. taking the science and wrapping it up and building a commercial process around it, because this, there's no questions about the, the fact that the science is happening. It is happening. And I, I have to ask about the Shell Game Changer program, yeah. the accelerator program. It's in the share owner's best interest to get what it is that you can dis- disclose. I know you're in the process of, 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 you know, the beginning stages of marching through 2023 um, mm-hmm. with, with Shell uh, being chosen in the Game Changer program. Yeah. I-, I want you to kind of speak a little bit generally to the share owners about what this could potentially mean for the Aduro opportunity. And more importantly, we all know when we sit back a little bit and we identify how big this plastic problem is, we're talking about in the neighborhood of 325 million tons produced annually. We've got current technologies that are running at about 50 to 60 percent recovery efficiency. And we've got you guys here now that really have had one of the most large validation that I've seen in, in this market that, that, that has come about. What is that going to mean? in accelerating your guys' uh, path to bringing this product to market and starting to really uh, get this product in the, in the hands of, of where it needs to be in, in solving the problem that we have. Um, uh, thank you for, for, you know, asking it. I mean, it, it's, of course, it's critically important for us. Uh, I'll start by saying, actually, I'll be in reserve and I'll say we can only say about Shell, whatever there is yep. in the market. Yep. Um, I think personally for me, there is two levels of what does it mean for a duo. Um, um, the first is that, uh, you know, Shell has been investigating the technology and, you know, in my heart I knew, but the fact that we 
been granted an access to talk to Shell. This is the second largest company in the world. I mean, it's a huge honor. Uh, yes, it is. And uh, for us, uh, uh, you know, to, to be part of, of uh, and communicate with, with experts at Shell in general, I mean, lots of uh, uh, good stuff could come out of it. You can, of course, imagine it uh, and, and start thinking, yeah, what, what can be done with this? So, so very, very exciting. So on the level of uh, authentication or maybe acknowledging that the science is there, that, that is maybe the first element. Uh, yeah. Beyond that, uh, of course, Shell has, um, has uh, the, the program has opened the door for us uh, to work maybe on, uh, we, we develop it in, in six phases. And with each phase, we're moving forward. We, we show some things, then we move forward and we show some things. And, you know, as we move uh, into the, the yeah. project, we, we advance our operation based on feedback uh, that we have uh, from Shell and by Shell's expert. And... Um, Shell has, uh, beyond that program, Shell has, uh, uh, you know, with the Duro, a commercial agreement, but it's it's uh, it's confidential, and I don't want to speak course. about it. We want to be very, very careful, and we want to honor Shell. We don't want to be over, you know, promoting on this. We just want to be reserved on one hand, but we want to uh, make sure that we are delivering to the letter uh, with Shell. And this is what we intend to do as a company. We are so hungry. Uh, to this success, the team is ready. We have excellent team that is uh, working twenty four seven. They've stayed so for so long in the company for this opportunity to show it to people such as Shell. And so you you can't imagine. I mean, uh, there is there is of course now they, they have to you know they have to work for it right now and prove it. Uh, but uh, right. you can you can appreciate the level of excitement that that we have when we're doing it. Uh, within Shell, there is a bunch of experts that can help us and every feeder that we are getting help us shape our understanding both on the commercial side and, and back on the technology. So there's multiple advantages for us uh, working with Shell. Fantastic. For the viewers that uh, don't understand the Game Changer program, I will put a mm -hmm. link in the description to the one public announcement that Aduro had in being accepted uh, uh, late last year, 2022, mm -hmm. um, just sets up 2023 as one of those many things to uh, to observe. For 2023, and, and yeah, for go ahead. Ryan, sorry to, to interrupt. No, please. You mentioned certain volumes, um, you know, that out there, in millions of tons, you know, um, the, the plastic problem is so big that you need 10 shells to, to make a dent, just if you, <laughs> if you really want to. to. There's endless amount of, of volume there. Um, just to give uh, some some understanding to the public, what does it mean? Shell really wants to, to process about a million, I think a million uh, tons per year. Um, I think it's by 2030. Yeah. Uh, well, you just mentioned 340 of them. So how many shells do you need to, to deal with the plastic problem? So yeah. it's about uh, working in many areas and with different collaborators to try and make a dent on a story that is definitely sensitive and, and you know, to all of us, right? We all yeah. get emotion about it in one way or the other. I, I think for me, I felt a little bit uh, disappointed in myself when I started doing my due diligence on this topic in understanding that my understanding of recycling, when it left my household, as much as we all consume on a daily basis, what actually was the end disposition? There wasn't a, a cradle to grave. It was really a generation to either the landfills or the oceans. And it was my understanding that when it went in the green box, that it went to actually be disposed of, recycled, and turned into new material. Th that is that is not the, the case. And I think a lot of people are naive to and don't truly understand the magnitude of the problem. And up till now, the lack of technology that it goes into mm -hmm. solving this problem. Can you speak a little bit about the efficiency and the cost and your technology, which is hydrochemolytic, and how it separates you guys from the competition in these right. companies that are trying to bring solutions to bear right. in the early stages of this uh, of this initiative? Yeah, so I'll start uh, by saying that we, we feel a lot, not just about the competition, we feel that we can work you know, with the competition, not just against the competition. Of course, of course. Um, the competition for many, many years, you know, th there were several approaches being developed 
over the years to deal with with um, with recycling of plastic. Uh, uh, one of them being the mechanical, which is the straightforward uh, approach. Yeah. The other one being more of a solvent. But you put some material in some kind of a liquid and you get something. Then the other one, the, the higher level would be more of the thermal approach, which you're basically breaking, breaking uh, material. And you can associate the thermal approach with, uh, uh, you know, there are some water-based technologies and uh, hydrothermal liquidification and there are pyrolysis. And then there is higher level like gasification that are just simply uh, destroying things and, and bringing them back. So mm -hmm. overall, um, it, it's uh, accepting waste in general, is really, really tough because you're talking about different type of chemicals that are coming into the same pot yeah. and, and they react to the same condition differently. And so, why, you know, no surprise if you put them in certain temperature, you know, some things will be, you know, will behave X and the other things will behave Y. And there is penalties associated with that. And now what you see against it is that, you know, before, uh, in order to come up with a valuable, some kind of a reasonable product, you would have to uh, maybe do some uh, higher level post or pre-processing uh, treatment, so sorting. And if mm -hmm. because you've done your work, let's say if you've done it to a certain level, um, it's not enough, and you have to do some post-processing uh, at the later stage. Now, now you can see that you know this is a material. Basically, plastic is very cheap. It's everywhere and anywhere. Yeah. And so if, the minute you touch it, you start accumulating negative costs, but it comes immediately with the fact to, to the reality that you have to, um, you know, collect it and sort it and do all kinds of things with it. Of course, it's easier to turn, you know, put it on, a, on some kind of a fire or, or throw it into the landfill. Yeah. yeah, That is the reality in general, just because it's a very, very complex problem. I'll, I'll differentiate also between areas that are uh, more regulated and areas that are not regulated. So I, I'm happy you're, you're putting your material in the blue box in the bins and you think all is good. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But we're not, you know, the center of the world. The rest of the world, you know, you take most of the population out there, it's not what what is happening. Uh, uh, you know, you're talking about Latin America and you talk about India and you talk about other areas that as much as they want, um, there's lack of resources to do that type of operation. And uh, the operation that you're talking about, like the blue bean, are more in the, you know, more advanced countries. And so we are we seeing a differentiation there. And so, for example, a lot of the plastic problem, you know, remains the same in those countries and yeah. nothing happens there. So in a way for us, it's a market and I'll explain why is it a market. Uh, but going back to to the you know our our reality where you're saying I'm putting it in the plastic bin and I'm doing something with it, um, soon enough because the situation is so complex, uh, you start accumulating costs. So in this um, environment, the one that can work in a little bit less temperature, the one that can work in you know take a little bit more contaminating, the technology yeah. that can do higher yield, and uh, maybe that is is obviously the the technology that will be cheaper and has a, a higher chances to survive what's going on in our reality. And what's going on in our reality yeah. is basically that uh, a competing processes has to go for size, you know? So they put build large and larger and larger and larger site, but that's in, in return create a commitment and demand for waste uh, for many years to, to, to come in, in, you know, large radios that in return increase the value of the feedstock yeah. and so you know this is a rolling uh, stone that goes push you up more and more and more and by the way there is a lot of rejection as you mentioned so for example with those guys that are fighting for the for the best of the best of the material that is out there and rejecting a lot because a duro can work in an environment that has a little bit more contaminated material we see ourselves as complementary to those you know we don't have to replace them we see ourselves as as complementary Duro can operate in a smaller scale unit closer to the resource or to the area where uh, your, your waste is there. And so if I'll take you now to the less regulatory environment, let's say Mexico for now, yeah. um, then, of course, smaller unit that closer to the edge of where the, 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 the feedstock is there, that creates uh, uh, activity and higher value product while reducing the negative cost of transportation and yeah. everything that associated with the emission and footprint 
has a chance to become sustainable there without building multi-billion dollar operation. So Adoro is benefiting from both sides. One, in the higher regulator, we absolutely, you know, we can compete and we'll be more efficient in many ways from the legacy technologies that we see. But we actually want to work with them. And, and the market will adjust itself and we'll take material that they, they are rejecting. Yeah. And, you know, there'll be maybe higher recycling activity in that sense. And with a market that is actually fairly open and not a lot of penetration is happening. And you can look in, into the charts and, and see where uh, the big companies are operating. They're more operating in North America and Europe, yeah. less operating in Latin America and India, although it's coming there. Our solution provides an opportunity to, to do smaller operation and more localized operation. And now you're talking about, you know, things that are associated with ESG because you are creating work. Yeah. And yep. you're creating, uh, uh, you know, you're helping cleaning the land. There's so much good stuff that goes on in this that, you know, you just don't want to stop. And so for us, it's just another secondary market. And we are um, actively developing both. So although we're getting attention from big organizations and such as Shell, we are actually pursuing smaller opportunities to sustain ourselves, to understand how does it look in, in such a remote market. Because we want to learn that. We want to create that. It will create benefit, you know, monetary benefit for the investors, but it's also create a, a, a greater good because you know you can operate in those organizations. And this is what Absolutely. we're trying to do, right? Working with everyone to create some kind of a good things out of it. That's that's incredible. Um I, I wanna I wanna switch a little bit and talk about um pending mandates. And I, I don't necessarily like that word. I think that um, in in what I've researched, there a, a lot of these large companies know that there is going to be a cap on historical production and new production. They're going to have to find a, a different way to do business. These mandates are looming. Twenty twenty five is right around the corner. Mm -hmm. How much, in your sense, does that play into the? The, the search right now that these large companies are on, or, or is it a healthy mix of both knowing that they need to move in a different direction or is it a healthy mix of both? Can you speak on that a little bit over? Yeah, I, I think first of all, it's a, it's health mandate by itself. Um, it's a, uh, it's healthy, but it needs to be measured and the future yeah. of it is very, very, very new. At, at the end of the day, you know, th those, those costs will, somehow trickle down into the product and you'll see a higher cost into it. Well, but sorry. what you know already, what we know already that, you know, even if we, let's say, pay cheaper product, and but then we, we eat fish with plastic product in it, it may not be a good idea, if you know what I mean. So there's a balance there that needs to be, you know, yeah. to be uh, handled. Uh, the consumer uh, um, or the, the regulation behind the mandate are such that uh, uh, producer responsibility are such that organization... Uh, that are producing, uh, let's say, product and are, are responsible to, to distribute those products uh, into the, to, the, to the consumer are taking some responsibility to aggregate and collect them and to find them in other house. And so there is a different, um, mm. uh, it, it's, not, it's not one for all. Uh, the concept is, is, is you know, distributing and, and increasingly uh, expanding even to territories such India and Mexico, by the way, for sure. you to know. But it's uh, it's uh, deviate based on case by case. But in in general, what it means is, you know, in the case, let's say, of Loblo and Coca Cola and others that are producing a lot of food packaging, uh, they will pay some fees, membership fees, to a nonprofit organization that will be responsible to not just uh, engage with the uh, other uh, organization to collect that type of product, right. but also will engage with companies like us to find them a, a better a better alternative than just uh, incinerating. So it is absolutely helping us in many ways. Uh, on the other hand, I can tell you, Aduro, because Aduro can work in, um, in a more of a, there is a, a little bit higher freedom to do to work in, in the you know the contamination material yeah. i feel that um, we, we are we're enjoying a bit of a both world whatever regulation will be there i think will be awesome and yeah. we'll beat it and whatever non-regulation will be there we'll just you know we're, we're trying to make money without the government right every time you, you you're negotiating and, and hoping that the government you'll make money with the government okay it may be true but we, we want to make money without the government and so 
yeah. in our business case, we have models for both. And I think Aduro will benefit hugely from that uh, uh, regulatory that are coming in. I agree. I, I think now more than ever in 2023, I have seen a, uh, uh, an initial focus, especially from the younger generation of investors who put ESG acknowledgement and the governance that exists around those companies, um, like yourself, that have these initiatives where it's, it's much bigger than the stock ownership. It's, it's a lot about acknowledging the initiative that those companies are putting forward to reduce greenhouse emissions, to, to, to lower, working to lower those carbon scores for companies and really looking to, to find that, that, that initiative. It, it's not just about investing in companies anymore that are profitable. Um, it, it is really a renewed focus and understanding and people are making their investment decisions based on that, that yeah. ESG acknowledgement. Yeah, I do want to. This I, is important, and I have to say, from time to time, I do see positive news that are coming in about about you know us. We we, we often are, are buried in our own world and are busy in our own <laughs> things. But yeah, you know, I I saw a link deal today and advertising about uh, you know uh, Great Reef in Australia that is has more curl. Like there are some positive impact that is happening, although we don't see it. It sometimes it, the problem is so big that we don't see the end of it. And that's generally the case, I guess. And it's very frightening and, and what have you, you know, the, those are the issues. But uh, you, you can see that sometimes there is positivity that comes out of it. We're definitely part of those technologies that I call the next generation uh, technologies that are capable of doing something in a, maybe in a better form or less, uh, less uh, impact. And I'll say it again, it, maybe, you know, in one day it will replace some technologies, but often... What you find out that you just work nearby and there is a deviation and you just collaborate well and you make a lot of money do that and that's fine as well that's great the, the plastic problem has compounded itself over many many decades yeah. and i think it's safe to say that the problem is not going to be solved overnight and and no and my, my no. charge to aduro is take take whatever time you need i i know if we could have this tomorrow we could take it because oh, the planet if we could do needs it tomorrow, this. we'll do it. Trust me, we've the been planet, the planet. The planet needs we're longing it. Longing to to show it out and expand yeah. it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I think people, if they would just increase their little bit of knowledge and to the magnitude of this problem, um, I, I think they would be rooting for you, irrespective of whether or not they were a share owner in the company, um, and, or, or not. I, I think that's true. As we round out the interview here, um, I do want to ask you about R two. Um, mm -hmm. That's been or, or completing, if not completed, in, in its development. And now mm -hmm. entering the testing phase. Yeah, fantastic. What is that going to mean for uh, customer yeah. engagements going into twenty twenty three? Yeah, so, and over? so um, let's say ten years until today. <laughs> um, laboratory equipment, so you know pots yeah. and pans and cooking, and so people would ask you, yeah, but is this? Can you make a commercial product out of it? Amen. So R two is really the first time. And it's not won't be the same reactor. We already know that we have to change some things, but it's the first time that you're thinking continuously. So, so there's a motivation. So it becomes a, a lesser of a science experiment, and now you're moving to the bigger deal. Yeah. And there's no way around it. We have to go through the motion of building, you know, uh, tackling small stuff, and then going into uh, uh, maybe medium-sized stuff, and then building bigger stuff. That's what you know. In every in a gener in a journey of um, commercialization of a technology, you have to go through those stages and mm. you would be really, uh, you'll make a big mistake if you'll jump from one to the mm. other thinking that you'll save money. There's plenty of dead bodies uh, awesome. all over Ryan. I can take you to Alberta and I'll show you uh, some of them if you like. Um, and basically wow. because of that, uh, in, in, on the other end of it, that sometimes uh, people go to the safe. So whatever it is out there, like Parosis and the others, and so you have to be very, very careful in, in the way you are, you are moving uh, through those stages. Uh, the net result is that us running a continuous flow material process uh, will teach us a lot about the possibility and what is required to do to move it from uh, this current stage to a commercial uh, project. The optimism uh, behind, you know, or the positive thoughts behind uh, the fact that we think we can do it really, really quickly is, again, embedded in the technology's benefit. So if we're working in uh, lower temperature, if we're working with higher 
level of contamination, if we're producing, you know, higher yield, we're doing more good things than bad things. So we have less problem to solve. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's the concept. It's not that we think we can jump to a, a commercial process immediately, but we have this sense that if we're doing things right, you can move it uh, uh, through the journey. We haven't seen anything right now that tells us no. It's always a possibility. It's a new science. It's a new research, right? We are yeah. you know, developing our own history right now. There's no book about the things that we're doing. There's a lot of book about everything else. Some, you know, everything, you know, gasification, pyrolysis, yeah. hydrothermal liquidification, whatever you want. There's books and books and books. You can find them. You can do it. You can Google or you can develop some kind of improvement. For us, every step that we're taking is novel. Is novel, new. yeah. It's created a lot of interest. Uh, and of course, uh, on this journey, you have to move through the motion and, uh, and, and just do R2 and then R3, which is a bigger, it's a ton per day. So R2 is a few kilos per hour. R3 will be a ton, two tons per day. And yeah. we're even thinking now, dare to think even, you know, larger units, 20 tons, right. 10 tons a day, which is becoming, a, you know, a commercial like. But it's just a thinking now. Right now, our focus is just to commission and run uh, the R2 because that is the milestone that we have we have to do in the next few months. Fantastic. As we wrap it down, I want to invite everybody who has stayed with us through the totality of the interview to visit AduroCleanTech.com. There is too much to unpack with Aduro Clean Technologies. There are two other verticals that we didn't even discuss this evening. We touched on them a little bit. If you want to understand more, we'll I highly back. please, yep, wait, do, please don't be a stranger because I tell you what, uh, it's going to be very exciting uh, as we march into 2023 and beyond to really track your guys' progress. I think the world um, is rooting for you. Uh, and I think for the most part, the intention behind providing this awareness is to introduce what you guys are bringing to bear. I, I'm I'm passionate about it. Um, well, I have been since. Now, Ryan, I, first of all, thank you very much. I mean, I, I just okay. want to thank uh, on behalf of my team that is working around. I mean, thank you for for the opportunity and thank you for the investors that actually put the trust in us and let us do what we do. Uh, we're absolutely committed to uh, deliver it, you know, through this uh, journey and to bring it into a, a safe shore. We feel we can do it, and so far in 2022. Um, we, we talked about 2022 as uh, maybe building the building blocks. So giving yeah. the companies those tools, such as uh, the bitumen unit, the flash drum that we needed, uh, building a bigger, a bigger uh, uh, laboratory, and, and commissioning the, the R2 or building the R2. 2023, in our case, is the integration of those building blocks. In other words, running those units, bringing it to, to the stage where we can engage customers, developing projects with those customers. Those customers need to see this um, through the R2 and going forward in order to understand how to integrate that going for, you know, in, in their, on their sites. And as I mentioned, there are small projects and large projects, and so it's very bubbly, and you have to learn a lot of information. But anyway, that, that's kind of a, uh, for us, 2023 will be just the integration of those building blocks. Absolutely. I'm, I'm expecting the investors to see going forward from us. Absolutely. We'll be uh, patiently waiting for those uh, updates as they become available. Oh, for on behalf of the channel here, you heard it here in 2023. I don't know how we're going to top this, but we are just getting started in 2023, looking for really, really a brighter future here. It's been pretty rough markets the last couple of years, but there are pockets of value. Uh, and it, um, it, bright, it shines no brighter than with Aduro Clean Technologies. Ofer Vikas, co-founder, CEO of Aduro Clean Technologies. Thank you so much, sir, for coming on the channel. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Ryan, and Happy New Year to everyone. Same to you, Ofer. Take it easy. Bye-bye.